start, shall we? Can anyone hear me all right with that? All right. Benakti na fela podrek orif. This Mr. Shona Brashna Khan. She can't find an Brashna Khani. Rovak agas tolgas me i Timaru. Ach tamay mahoni i ganidnanish. Agus honag mashinshir as iran. Is star me? Is comedy me a cover i an museum show? Falcha come a lecture in you. Just thought we'd start with a little bit of Irish. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just saying, uh, Sean Brosnan's my name. I'm the clan chieftain of the Brosnans. Uh, I was born and brought up in Timaru. So I live in Dunedin now. And my ancestors come from Ireland. Um, I'm a historian, an historian, and I work as a curator here at the museum. And welcome to my lecture today. So this is the topic, Erin Gabra. The Irish in Otago and South, and I've got a wee um, shonokol there, a, a proverb. Ni hidna firwara, a wanas an fori gone. It's not the great men or women that always reap the harvest. It's just a way of looking at things where my research has mostly been not on the, the knobs, if you like, but the ordinary people who make up the Irish uh, diaspora and who made up the Irish immigrant could come in here to Otago and Southland. Um, now I have a website, the Brosnan, and the address is up the top there, and I put um, most of my historical research on there so that people can access it easily, and you can download it for free, and use it as you like. i just like you that you acknowledge that source if you've used anything I've written. Um, so if you're interested in a little bit more information, I've got quite a few different research papers uh, posted on there and you're welcome, as I say, to use them. Irish immigration. When we talk about immigration from or to anywhere, traditionally we've sort of talked about push and pull factors. The things that have pushed people out of the place that they immigrate from, and the things that have pulled them towards the places they immigrate to. And that's a nice simple um, dichotomy as how it works. But of course it's much more complex than that. In every case, there are a lot more, many more factors involved. So I like to think of it as being the opportunity matrix. Uh, and you can think about all the ways in which opportunity is constrained in the home place by all sorts of factors, and the way in which opportunities are greater in the destination countries. That's why people immigrate. I mean, it costs them a lot often. It's quite difficult to do. Some of you are immigrants, and you'll know that that's the case. But it's always this shifting kaleidoscope of constraining things at home and opening opportunities, or you hope there are, in other places. So that's what I call the opportunity matrix. And it applies very much, of course, to the great Irish migrant stream. Ireland is a very small country, but it's got an outsized record of immigration and has had a disproportionate impact on the rest of the world accordingly, particularly, of course, the United States, but also Canada, Britain, Australia, and not the least of it here in New Zealand. But we are the farthest destination from Ireland. So actually, we're not very important to Ireland in terms of an immigrant destination. But Ireland is pretty important as an immigrant source for us historically, third only behind the Scots and the English. There's a very concentrated time frame for the Irish migrant flow to New Zealand. It really didn't get underway until the 1850s in significant numbers, and it peaked in the 1870s and then fell off a cliff in the 1880s. And it never really perked up again thereafter, although there has been a steady stream of people. And in recent years, there's been quite a significant growth in Irish migration again, but it's very different in character to the 19th century flow. So I'll talk a little bit about that in, at the end if we get to the end. I've got a lot packed in here, I might not get it all done. But the first part of the opportunity matrix is knowing that somewhere exists. So there weren't any Irish migrants to New Zealand in the 16th century, because no one in Europe knew that New Zealand was a place in the 16th century. It took this fella here, one of my big heroes, Captain James Cook, 
a half Scot who came to New Zealand in 1769 on the endeavour and mapped the country for the first time, thereby pulling it into the ambit of the intellectual world, if you like, of Europe as a place that existed and potentially a place that could be exploited or that people could ultimately go through to. It's worth noting that the, he did have Irishmen on board ship on all three of his voyages. Uh, there were a couple of Irish sailors aboard the Endeavour, uh, Timothy Rarden from Cork, Josh Childs from Dublin. On a second voyage, he had Patrick Whelan and Francis Murphy, who were quartermasters, and James Patton, the surgeon who saved his life. And on the third voyage, a very notorious character called John Mara from Cork, who was secretly writing a diary below decks, which he um, subsequently published before Captain Cook got his own version out, and which is a very um, rare insight into the world of exploration from below decks. Now, Captain Cook thought John Mara was a pretty good sailor, but he was also the sailor aboard the Resolution that got punished the most. So make of that what you will. Nonetheless, that's the first time that Irishmen came to New Zealand. Now the next big impact in terms of the New Zealand flow is the settlement of New South Wales as a convict settlement very shortly after Cook had made the discovery of mainland Australia, particularly New South Wales, Botany Bay as a convict destination. And there was a disproportionate p number of Irish convicts sent out to Australia. <laughs> many more than, relatively speaking, there were Scots or English, because of the way in which the um, justice system worked in the three different countries. So in Scotland, transportation was sort of held as a last resort and only for very serious crimes. In England and Ireland, it was a different kettle of fish. You could be sent abroad for you know, stealing a loaf of bread, that sort of thing. And in Ireland, there was the added complication of what you might call political crimes. So there were you know, rebellions and treasonous activity which saw people being transported. But for the most part, the convicts who went to Australia from Ireland were actually just ordinary criminals, but at a reasonably low level quite often, not particularly serious crimes. And most of them, of course, stayed there and became, in due course, founding population of Australia and made a big contribution to the country. They're more important than here, because um, they're there earlier, there are more of them over a longer period. Um, worth noting too, there were a lot of Irish women among the convict population, again disproportionate numbers, um, mostly again low level criminals, a lot of prostitutes for instance, um, and they too made a, a big contribution as the mothers of uh, pioneer Australia. But then we get the big event. People had been immigrating from Ireland through the 18th century in increasing numbers, but they were mostly going to the United States and they were mostly going from Ulster. It was a largely Protestant Irish phenomena, Presbyterians who were constrained at home by the same sorts of prescriptions that applied to Catholics. They also applied to Presbyterians in Ulster. So they went for religious liberty, they found land and opportunity, and many more followed. So the big number went there, and by the early 19th century, they were being followed by lots of Irish from the south as well. So there's already a, a migrant flow. But then we have the, the Great Famine on Gorta Moor, and that really just wreaks havoc across the island, but particularly in the west, the poorest, uh, most backward part, which is hit the hardest by the famine. And there's an enormous outflow. The most um, significant event in, in Irish history in the 19th century is the famine and its consequences, which on the first part involve a million people starving to death, uh, another million or so, uh, I'm just throwing numbers out there, huge numbers dying of starvation, even more dying of the diseases that swept in behind that, typhoid and all the rest of it, and then an enormous number that emigrate to America and to Britain. Not so much here. Now why was that? Why didn't they come here? Well, the answer is always kind of obvious. It's so far to come, it takes so long, it costs so much, and there just weren't any ships heading this way at the time that poor Irish people could get on. So they went where they could, the opportunity matrix. The opportunity was to go to America on, well you talk about the coffin ships, and that's a little bit overrated that concept because actually there was just one really bad year, 1847, most of the people that went to um, America on the ships got there. But this is a great um, famine memorial in um, Dublin just by the Liffey, some of you will be familiar with it, skeletal elongated figures which capture some of the horror 
of the famine years, particularly Black 1847. And here we have the suggestion of the coffin ships or the large numbers of people that were going to America. Now, as I say, there weren't many that came to Australia from the famine directly, and even fewer to New Zealand, but there were some. We, for instance, discovered that one of the women who's on the portrait gallery in the Smith Gallery is a famine baby. She was born in Ulster in, I think, 1847, that worst year um, of the famine. And her family, uh, extended family, two families, came here thereafter to the brand new settlement in 1848 of Otago. So it's not that there were no famine immigrants, it just wasn't a substantial flow. That's the Strain family, if anyone's interested, and you can look at Mary Ann Strain's portrait in the gallery. But the really important thing about the famine, from an Otago and New Zealand point of view, is the long-term structural changes that it created in Ireland. Because such was the shock of the devastation, and it effectively wiped out a whole class of people, the cottier class at the bottom of the heap, the people who didn't own land or rent it in their own right, but just subsisted on the land of others growing a crop of potatoes. When the potato crop didn't work, those people died or left, and they didn't come back. So there was a change in the nature of Irish agriculture towards bigger farms, to um, a cattle grazing instead of tillage, and a substantive change in social practice. So that no longer were small farms being subdivided to, to divide up the next generation. Instead, they were held tight and they were made bigger. And you only handed the farm over to one son, the tenancy. It wasn't the land that you owned, it was the tenancy. And only one daughter got a dowry. Everyone else had to shift for themselves. And in terms of large families, that meant most young people growing up in Ireland grew up with the awareness that they had to go somewhere else to make their own way in the world. If they stayed in Ireland, the opportunities were so constricted that they couldn't really expect to ever marry, ever have land of their own. They would always be the poor relations on other people's farms and eking out a listen. This is particularly the case for women, very limited opportunities for women in Ireland. And so you get a pattern of immigration where it's the young and the unattached who are leaving in huge numbers, and there's an even gender balance which is unique among the diasporic populations at that time. All the other immigrant groups are heavily weighted towards the men. But in the Irish case, the women match them, particularly in America, sometimes they're ahead. Because America was, for Irish women, a land of real opportunity, and Ireland wasn't. So that's that opportunity matrix panning out. But just remember the fact that it's young, unattached um, people that are the ones that immigrate. And they knew, it grew, as I say, they grew up knowing that. And also knowing a lot about the places they could go to. Because the immigrants that went anywhere sent information back about those places. And unlike the promotional bump put out by you know, immigrant recruiters and immigration societies trying to attract people, there was a lot of confidence in the word of your cousin, your brother, your fellow villager, people from the same townland. When they told you information about how you got there, what it was like on the ship, what the wage rates were like, what the price of land and your availability to get it was like, you knew that was rock solid information. So people tended to go where other people had gone. Okay, that's a really important phenomena. Once there's a beachhead established, those are the places that other people go to. There's someone that will support them when they arrive as well, another really important consideration. So they don't just turn up on the shore, particularly if you're English isn't your first language, as it wasn't for many of the people who left in the 19th century, particularly the people from the West. You had people to help you navigate and get a start, and away you go. And this is the case here in New Zealand as well. So this is just, by the way, a little ad. Our um, new documentary, Journey to New Edinburgh, um, the first part of which is launched next uh, Thursday should appear on our website then. If not, it'll be here on show for a few days in the museum and subsequently appear on our website. This is from uh, one of the episodes called The Greening of Otago, which is about the Irish contribution to Pioneer Otago. So you just look out that. But the, the scene itself is the National Famine Memorial uh, just beneath Crow Patrick. And that ship, as you can see, if you look closely, all that tangled bit in the rigging, those are skeletal figures. It's a quite a moving um, 
uh, monument, and there's a matching one in America, I think it's in Canada, by the same sculptor, which is completely different. It's healthy, well, thriving people charging off, ready to start again. So it's a, it's a neat bookend to the two sides of that opportunity matrix, if you like. All right, so that level of migration from Ireland that was just huge in the famine period was sustained thereafter at a very high rate, the highest rate of any European group. Now, that doesn't mean a lot of people necessarily, because Ireland's a small country with a small population, but proportionally, the numbers leaving Ireland were much higher than any other group throughout the late 19th century. They were always number one in the league of immigrant rates, ahead of the Scots and the Norwegians until the early 20th century. And that meant that you know, by um, the beginning of the 19th century, I think that's when it was, the Irish population dropped by half, from 8 million just before the famine to 4 million. So that's an incredible consequence of um, migration in particular, also obviously the mortality of the famine. But this, this gives you a sense of that slowly diminishing but very high level of um, immigration. But how'd they get here? That's the story of the day. So here we go. These are Otago's typical early settlers. <laughs> and we find right in the middle of them, Dennis McGuinness, standing in for all the paddies and I suppose the biddies as well. And see the other ones there. It's quite a, I, love, I love this cartoon. I think it's really cool. Um, anyway, but here's how it starts. Because when organised migration to New Zealand began in the 1840s, this is when there's systematic schemes to bring people from Europe, from Britain obviously, to New Zealand, which is a complicated, expensive process, all those immigration schemes consciously excluded Irish Catholics. So when you get Wellington, New Plymouth, Nelson, Otago and Canterbury established, they're not looking for us. I'm talking about me. They're not looking for me, my four bears, they don't want us. We're the people they don't want. They want the Scots and the English. They're trying to replicate the best versions of England and Scotland and the new land and they want you know, a hierarchical society but the people at the bottom aren't the paddies. It's yeoman farmers from Scotland and England. Fair enough, because those are the best farmers in the world at that time. These are really good people to get, so I'm not, I'm not begrudging them that. Um, so that's the case with, with Otago as well. Oh, so, so this is a quote from Father Jean-Baptiste Petitjean, who was one of the Marist missionaries based in Wellington who had come down to Otago to cater to the scattered Catholics across the region, which were you know, oftentimes English and Scottish Catholics, but there were some, um, by the later period, 1857, there were a number of um, Irish ones as well. And this is what he said, they're like contraband. They managed to sneak in. You know, they got in around things. This is very much the case. He's bang on with that. It's a great way to um, conceptualise it. Because this is the scheme that settled Otago, the, the free church scheme, where they were very picky about who they provided assisted passage to. And that's a word I haven't mentioned before, but it's absolutely critical to that constrained period of Irish migration from the 1850s to the 1880s. That is the period in which you could get assistance to come all this way. So it removed some of those barriers of distance, time and cost that otherwise made New Zealand very much not appealing to the Irish. You could get assistance to go other places or, or go to America where it was much cheaper, much quicker, much shorter. So all those opportunity costs were much lower. So to counterbalance that and to compete against all these other places in the world, if we wanted people you had to compete with these other places and you had to do that by providing subsidised migration. So that's the case here in Otago too. But in subsidising migration, you got to select who came. You could be very picky about it if there was sufficient demand, which oftentimes there was. If there wasn't, you had to take who you could get. And there's a wee opportunity there for us, which we seize. But this is worth remembering. To get into Otago at the beginning, if you're Irish and Catholic, it was pretty hard to get past this selection screen. In fact, it was impossible. There were no Irish Catholics that got past this in the normal manner. There was certainly um, an Irish Catholic on the Philip Lang, but he was a sailor, and he got here to be a settler by um, deserting William Welsh. But otherwise, no Irish Catholics, as far as I'm aware, and I've looked pretty closely, got through the screen in the period of the Otago Association which is from 1850 to 1852 or so. So this is the people that, that did get through when they did. And this is a sort of um, characterisation of them. 
they were people down the bottom of the heap with pretty limited skills. Um, oftentimes not with English even. If so, as the second language usually, they were Irish speakers. Um, limited educations, often illiterate, but a capacity to work. And to work in a kitchen or in the field, which by the 1850s, late 1850s is what Otago really needed. By the late 1850s, they need a lot of people to do work, hard, hard work, because building a colony, they don't just appear at a thin air. You know, you might land on the ground, but building a colony really does mean building. It's hard, 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 hard work, and you need hard workers to do it. These characters were hard workers. Here we go, more of this character. These are all from Dunedin satirical magazines, by the way. And you might look at the faces of the Irish people, and um, there's a famous... Um, book about apes and angels, the way in which this characterisation is apes applied to uh, the Irish was a form of discrimination and you can see it very clearly there, they were on a lesser scale on the sort of you know, Darwinistic idea of the hierarchy of peoples. But anyway, this is what I'm going to focus on now, the migration chain from Galway which broke through that blue Presbyterian cordon wrapped tight around Otago in the early years. How did they manage to do it? Well, this is ground zero in Galway. This is Comtenti in Anadown Parish, and it's the home cottage of William Kavanagh, who, by my estimation, is the very first Irish Catholic to come here as an immigrant in 1856. And he did it not from Britain, not from Scotland or England, but from Australia. Because by that period, there was such a need for workers here in Otago that the provincial government, newly established and able to fund such things, instead of just relying on the immigrant recruitment in Scotland and England, they thought we can get people pretty quickly if we send them to Australia, to Melbourne. So they sent uh, William Hunter Reynolds over there to do some immigrant recruiting, and he didn't give a bugger about where you came from or what your religion was. He'd actually grown up in Portugal, so he'd been surrounded by Catholic Portuguese throughout his early life. He didn't discriminate, and he on the very first ship that he sent over here, or maybe the second one, whatever, had William Cavanagh and a couple of other Irish guys. Now that was like the Achilles heel of this tight control system, because once you got one Irish character in, <laughs> and you had a system where people in the colony could nominate their friends and relations for assisted passages, and if they were nominated like that, they didn't have to go through the screening at the other end, they were already in as it were, and they would be sheltered and put up by their friends and relations here, so they got passages. That's what happened. So William Cavanagh arrives, and within a flicker of an eyelid, he's nominated his brother and sister to come as well from Britain. So they in Galway, they've got to get across to, where was it, Scotland or London, one or the other, and they know how to do that. Galway people have been going over to Britain, you know, spalting to seasonal harvests for, for ages, so they, they do know how to navigate that scheme. And they come on the George Canning in 1857. Now, if you look at that list, you can't see the name there. You can only see three names. There weren't just three names, three people on that ship. And this is one of the issues confronting us when we do research in the Otago migration records because there's a real paucity of record. The actual immigration records don't survive. All we have are substitutes, like this is called the debtors list. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. It's a record of all the people who had taken out assisted passage where they had to repay some money in due course once they got here and who hadn't done so at the date in 1869 when this was published and distributed around all the police stations in Otago so if policemen came across these people they could tap them hard on the shoulder and say hey pay back your passage money most of them didn't bother so this list remains as a great historical source for us but if we compare that list for the George Canning to the one that's in the newspaper which is in that period a full passenger list that, that deteriorates later too, we don't have those. We can see there John and Anna Kavner, who are the siblings of William Kavner. And he's got them out here. And of course, they know sooner get here, then who do they send for? <laughs> They're right, you know, more, 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 more. And so it goes. So every ship coming out thereafter, or every couple of ships, we have a few more people sneaking in. And you see William Kavner's name there in brackets. That means he was the sponsor of these two, Pat and Honor Ford here. He sponsored them, their passage cost £15, they arrived on that date there. And then we had the next ship, there's a few more people from Galway. You see it just never ends, you let one in, they just don't stop. <laughs> more, from Melbourne. Now this is a really good one to note because it arrived 
on the 17th of March 1861, which as you may know, is St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> and uh, all those people there are from Galway. And they're all being sponsored by people from Galway who are here already. So, you know, it's the Achilles heel of the say, and out they come. It wasn't the only migration chain like that. There was also one from Waterford. started in a similar way. In that case, it was a servant who came here with somebody else and then started sending for her family and other people from the same district. So once they know about it, and got some people to put them up, you get this small Irish float coming here. Now, this great passenger just here confirms that this is from the Melbourne, and this one unusually has the locations that the people came from. You can see all these Anna Downs, there's also Drum Griffin, which is in the same parish, it's where the post office is, so that would be the contact point. So there's a whole batch of them, it's just getting out of control. <laughs> Half of Anna Downs on its way here, and that's what happened, most of it came here. Um, in particular, this is Anna Down uh, in Galway. And these two are the two that arrived on the Melbourne in 1861, Pat Ford and Alan Crow. They're my great-great-grandparents. They never paid the money back, so I'm very pleased about that because their name's <laughs> on the list. Um, and this is them in old age. And, you know, what you can see from that photograph is that they succeeded as colonists. They did indeed secure land here, which they could never have done in Ireland. They got married here, which they could never have done in Ireland. They weren't the oldest. Uh, they had a big family of their own, and they all succeeded as well. They got land in South and on they went. So there they are, look at them. Hey. <laughs> Great old characters. Now, how did he succeed? Well, particularly by going to um, Gabriel's Gully in 1861. All of those Galway people who were here went up to Gabriel's Gully and did pretty well and invested that money they made from the gold, not in high living, I hope, but in land in Southland, which was the coming place. Now, it was land that was covered in bush, it was swamp land, but they got it cheap because they had to work really hard to clear the land and turn it into farms. But that's what they did. And all that land is still in Galway descended people's hands today. It's all those places around in Chicago with bush in their name, like Rosslyn Bush, Myros Bush, Rapahoka, around there, those sort of places. They were all bush covered land, which is now prime farmland. It has been for 150 years or so because of the work of characters like this. That's how they got ahead. And here's another one. This is my Scully um, family. The land is the point, and the house. You know, he's standing on his own land. He doesn't own rent to anybody. He owns the land and he can pass it on. So this is the key. This is the great opportunity here, which was, as Sir Tom Devine says in our documentary, for the Scots and the English as well, so seductive that in Scotland you couldn't own land of your own. You were a tenant farmer at best. Uh, if you were an agricultural worker, you could never aspire to become a tenant farmer by the mid-19th century. Even worse for the Irish, but in New Zealand... If you were in early, you could not only aspire to own land, you could own land. And they did. So that, that's, that's what it's all about. Now if we look back to Ireland, this is Galway, Anadown Parish, in 1812. It's a bog map, um, showing the bogs in that period. That's what they were mapping. But here you can see Clonburg, in the centre of Anadown Parish, where that's where my scully forebears come from. And it's over here. Uh, this, I'm not sure, they, they have funny ways to pronounce it. Anyway, this, this is where my forwards come from. And see these little spots? Those are the clockins, those are all the houses. See how they're all clustered together? So what the people did there, they lived in these little clockins and they all went out and farmed communally in the area around there. That's the way it rocked. But that was all going to change by mid-19th century as those farm practices were rationalised and modernised and made more efficient. So there was less opportunity for people um, to do that. So that's how so many people from this area end up coming to Otago or Southland in particular. So lots of you, I'm sure, will have Galway connections from this. I'm not, I know there'll be lots of you out there. Um, so that's where it is. The area just near Loch Corrib. And you can see down there where it is in terms of Galway. So that was a poor area. It had been really hit hard by the famine. Um, the levels of mortality in Anadown Parish were huge. Um, I can't remember, was it a quarter or a third of the people died? So what's important to remember, therefore, about the famine in terms of our migrants? Isn't it that they all rushed away from the famine devastation directly? What's really important to remember about it is that the people who came here in the 1850s and 60s and 70s grew up through this. They witnessed that. As children and as adolescents, they watched people dying around them. There wasn't a field in Anna Down that didn't have people buried in it through the famine period. So that's a deep, deep trauma in their childhood that they carried with them. I think that's really significant. Um, it meant for one thing, sorry. Um, it meant for one thing 
that the Irish language was their the native tongue. It was really high, um, still Gaelic speaking in, in Galway at this point. Their native tongue was abandoned pretty much in terms of, I mean, they still spoke it here, especially, you know, going to Mass on Sundays in the Pacifica, even to the 1920s, there were old people who would gather outside afterwards and speak together in the old tongue. They didn't pass it on. I think they didn't pass it on. Or stories about Anna Down. I think they didn't pass it on because it represented for them horror, backwardness, things they escaped from. And they were building a new life here and it was a life to be lived in English and in new ways of doing things. You know, they, they worked out new ways of farming. They had to adapt to all this you know, scientific farming which they got on top of. And also their religion was very different here. You know, people often think that Catholicism in Ireland in this period and in New Zealand would be the same. They weren't. There were radical divergences. Um, which we'll talk about a bit later. But it's a di- whole di- they adapted to a whole different way of being. And the Irishness was something they left behind because it represented lots of bad things for them. That's my theory anyway. Um, all right, moving along. Now, how we were able to make such good contacts in Ireland for our documentary, and I think this is really important, is by reaching to people in Anadown. This website, if you haven't discovered it before, Ireland Reaching Out, is a fantastic reverse genealogy website which will connect you up, if you want to, with any parish in Ireland. And you can just go looking for your parish where your people might come from. And then you often, not always, because it needs to have someone active at the other end, can connect up with people on the other side who can guide you through the local dimension. Because when you're trying to do history in two places, you've got to know a bit about both places. I don't know enough about Anna Down to really do that, but connecting up with people in Anna Down as we could through this website and also through this, Anna Down Heritage Society, an active group in Anna Down. Those people, they know the details there. They can put you in the right place and they can guide you through what this place means, how it relates to this place, you know, which if you just go for a casual visit, you know, you've got a couple of weeks in Anna Down, you're never going to get on top of that, but you can plug in here to local expertise, so it's really brilliant. Um, and so... Here we are, Irene McGoldrick of the Anna Down Heritage Society took me to my great-great-grandfather's home cottage, which I wouldn't have found otherwise. And this is Scully Row in Plondoo, again, you know, needed that help locally. And took me, took us to William Kavner's cottage, which as it happens, she owns. <laughs> How about that, you know, we're, we're going, we want to find where William Kavner is. Oh, yeah, I own that cottage. <laughs> His sister was her great-great-grandmother. Uh, so there you go, tight connections but they're really useful. So I, I recommend that to you um, as a way of making progress on the ground when you're trying to establish uh, your roots. But anyway, we talked about the gold rush before, and sure, those Galway characters did profit enormously by being here early, then on the ground, being able to get out there and benefit, but that opened a whole new flood of Irish coming here. The old Presbyterian exclusion no longer worked at that point, and you get Irish people coming here from all over the place through the gold rush, principally coming, of course, from Victoria, sometimes from California before that, if you're following the gold rushes around the world, but it meant a real diversity of origin points. So, you know, these characters here are from um, Tyrone. That's my great-great-grandparents. This is Paddy Galvin. I'm not sure where he's from. I think Cork or somewhere. This is Kilkelly's from Galway. This is a group at Waitahuna. This is Michael McCarthy, one of the first miners at Gabriel's Gully. You know, there were Irish people there uh, galore. And, of course, they left their mark um, on uh, the place name and all that sort of thing, you know, Cromwell, Queenstown, all those sort of places. So it is true that um, it was the discovery of gold that really broke open um, immigration to Otago and made it very Irish. But it's also the case that... Get all tangled up here. Also the case that those people who were here first, the Galway people, continue to use the levers of migration systems to keep bringing people here as well, and particularly from south. And so... In the early 1860s, Southland people got really brassed off with the way the government in Dunedin, which was their government, it was Otago, was the whole place at that point, was ignoring them. Wasn't spending enough money on bridges and roads and things in Southland. So they said, bugger this. Oh, well, we've been filmed live, sorry. Blow this. <laughs> We're going to separate out and become our own place. So they did. They formed the Southland Provincial Government, 1862. And briefly, they operated their own assisted immigration scheme with their own agents in Scotland and England to try and recruit people directly to bluff. So, great. If you have a look at these charts, you probably don't want to bore, get bored with the details. What it basically shown you is a sharp distinction between the Irish um, 
exploitation of those schemes as opposed to English and Scottish in that the nomination schemes were heavily dominated by the Galway people. That's, that's the main. So here we go. By 1864, you've got these two ships coming, and look, the number of people on the ship, not so many, all these ones in red are all people coming from Ireland, particularly from Galway. They have got a lock on it. They know what they're doing. So, you know, the poor old um, Southland people, the, the officials, were very disappointed with this. And you can tell this because they complained to the um, immigrant agent in um, Scotland, I think it was. And he defends himself, saying that, you know, he only ever took Irish passengers when he was absolutely desperate, when no one else would come and he had to fill a ship up. So, you know, I'm sorry, but, you know, when there's news from New Zealand of wars in the north, there's been a shipwreck, the, the supply dries off. And I, there's always Irish people waiting, but, you know, I, I had to take them, you know, because he's got a date, he's got a ship to fill. He has to fill it or it becomes a wasted space, a lot of money invested in that. So if he has to take someone, he'll take the Irish. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really stark. And the Anadown people really um, are, are the people that are mastering it. So anyway, it was so disappointing, 1864, these two ships, they flagged it away. No more assisted immigration to Southland. A few years later, they thought, oh, we'll give it another crack. So they, they had one more ship in 1868. Look at that. It was only for nominated people. There were 72 potential immigrants offered passages. Half of them were Irish. 40% of them were from Anna Down, or from Galway anyway. So they didn't bother after that. Just one last uh, hurrah, and that was it. But then we have the Vogel era of the 1870s, and this is the peak period for Irish migration to New Zealand, because in this period, there was no longer any targeting, well, there was to begin with, but the Irish were sufficiently numerous by then, had enough political power, that they could shake the uh, authorities in Wellington sufficiently that they began to extend uh, the advertising and the provision of uh, immigration agents through Southern Ireland, which they'd never done to that point. To that point, the 1870s had never been any immigrant agents or any advertising in the South of Ireland. It always been concentrated in Ulster, where you could get good, solid Protestants. So that was particularly targeted by Canterbury. A lot of them came to Otago as well. But in the Vogel period, you get them coming from all over the place. And, you know, there's all this sort of promotion. There's really good ships, big ships, big fast ships. It's the peak period. 100,000 plus people come in that Vogel period. And a large proportion of 25% are Irish. It's the biggest period of Irish migration to New Zealand ever. And when they stopped the assistant immigration in 1888, Irish migration goes off a cliff and never really comes back. Because when they begin to re-establish um, assisted migration programs in the 20th century, Ireland is no longer part of the British Empire, or if it is, it's not the Irish Free State, and they don't qualify for assisted passages as Brits. Uh, and again, from 18, 1950s to the 70s, you know, that later period, they're not part of that either. Anyway, here we've got some numbers. I don't know if you can read that, but what it basically is showing, can you read it? A bit, bit small. What it's showing you is that the top 10 counties that were sending people to Otago and South between 1872 and 1888 are much disproportionate to their proportion in Ireland. So the number of people who lived in any of those counties in Ireland is on the right. So just to focus in, uh, top is Cork, which had 9.4% of the population in Ireland in 1861, but 13, well basically 14% of the population of immigrants coming to Otago. And coming down, you can see the same thing. Galway there, it's over double. 3.75% of the Irish population in 1861, but over 8% of the um, Irish migrant flow to Otago and South, and so it goes. These are the top counties. And that's the case, you know, throughout the period of migration. I think the top six counties sent about 48% of all immigrants out to America as well. You know, it's, it's not just Irish people coming. It's quite targeted. And it's because of that opportunity matrix. People have the knowledge or the connections. So it's not just one big blancmange. It's quite focused. And this is the Otago Southland component of that story. Right. How'd they get on when they got here? Well, to be honest, they struggled, a lot of them. And not so surprising when you think about what they came out of and what they came with. Their lack of education, their lack of literacy, their lack of language oftentimes they're often going to be knocking along on the bottom of the colonial social heap, and that's where you get a lot of consequences um, for, you know, behaviour. So this is a, a, a um, good figure. Rates of illiteracy on marriage registrations in 1881. And look at the stark difference between the Catholics, which is basically Irish, 
and all the rest. Look at the levels of um, illiteracy. Huge. And there are consequences to that. That's a real um, social deprivation measure that applies across the board to your opportunities here. You know, if you can't read or write, you can't do lots of different jobs, can you? You know, you're restricted in what you can do. Uh, similarly, if you look at incarceration rates, here we've got the Irish born in 1886. Just under 9% of the population, but look, 27% of convicted prisoners. And if we make it Catholics, which is a broader thing of the ethnic group, because it's people born in New Zealand as well, 14% of the population, 34.5% of convicted prisoners. So what does that look like? It looks like Maori statistics today, doesn't it? Yeah. We're the Maoris in the 19th century here. <laughs> Over here we have the rates in asylums, because they struggled mentally as well. And you can see here the Irish-born, very significant rates. Uh, the, the figures will be different because it's the proportion of the people who went into asylums. Very significant. This is true across the board, across the world, with high um, rates of madness, criminality. So struggle. But on the other side, on the sort of positive side, we have this process of ethnicization, which is driven by the church, for, for the people I've been talking about. I mean, there are others I'll talk about when we get a chance. Time's running out, we're getting there. So here's Bishop Patrick Moran, the first Catholic Bishop of Dunedin, and there's our patron saint. And here are the three founders of the three big orders that come to Dunedin. Uh, Mother Mary Gabriel with the Dominicans, Brother Bodkin for the Christian Brothers, and uh, Mother Kate Kirby for the Mercies. And they establish here in Dunedin and across Otago and Southland a whole infrastructure of Catholic um, churches and schools and associated with them organisations that tie the community together in a cohesive way and give them a corporate mass which makes them stronger than their individual frailties and weaknesses. Not everybody buys into it. Lots of people, you know, don't want to be Catholics anymore, don't want to be Irish anymore, they go off and do their own thing. But for those that do, there's a cohesiveness to this Irish Catholic subculture which is orientated around the churches and the schools and which is a way of lifting those levels of illiteracy for a start off the nuns and the brothers, you know, we, we basically advanced socioeconomically within a couple of generations on the backs of the nuns, decisively. And this is a picture of St. Joseph's Cathedral and that sort of corporate life displayed to the world because it was a source of pride. You know, if you were a poor person coming from Galway, you might not have a lot to um, show off about. You know, your old um, folk tales and, you know, leprechauns. So there's not a lot to be making a big time and dance about, but. I call it Little Galway and Big Rome. Your Little Galway culture you weren't so proud of. But when you could plug into Big Rome, it's very flash. Protestants were quite impressed by it, you know. They weren't impressed by where you came from, but they might have been impressed by this sort of stuff, you know. So it was impressive. And that was really important in the socialisation of the Irish community here. Look, you know, that's the Catholic court. Look at the buildings. You know, Dominic's the cathedral, the bishop's house over there, right in the heart of Dunedin. That's a very different position for those poor paddies coming off the boats in 1856 and 57 and just sneaking in and scraping by. This isn't scraping by, this is a great big thing in the middle of town with Bishop Moran, who didn't say, didn't take a step back to anyone, very pugnacious character and very firm on um, the superiority of Irishness and Catholicism. And here we go, you know, the Dominican nuns. Look at, that, look at the beauty of that. That's fantastic, you know. That's epic. You know, you plug into that, you've got something to be proud about. I mean, there are negative parts of that as well. Not, I'm not disputing that. But a lot of positives to it as well. Here we have them building an uh, orphanage in South and Eden. So there's a whole lot of infrastructure that's cre it's created. And it doesn't just happen by chance. That costs a lot of money. And the people that built all that stuff, they were the poorest people. Irish Catholics were at the bottom of the heap, but they did the most building and they did the best building. I'll prove that <laughs> in a minute. This is J.B. Callan. Now, there were lots of areas of uh, economy and professions that Catholics, obviously, Irish Catholics, didn't have a chance of getting into because they didn't have the educational competencies. There's a few exceptions to that, of course. 
J.B. Callan for a long time was the only Catholic lawyer in Dunedin, and he became a judge, you know, so exceptional characters. But then we get all this sort of thing, you know. So rugby teams from Christian Brothers, um, cricket teams, who did really well, punched above their weight. The brothers were really big on that sort of thing. And in that way, these were vehicles towards participation in the wider society, as Christa van der Kroep, a historian from, from Massey, has said, they did it not as people apart, ghettoized, like you have in the United States, ghettos, you know. Here it was a people who were a part of things, but in an Irish Catholic way. They could participate with everyone else, but on their own terms, their own teams. So this whole parallel society gets developed. So if you have scouts, well, we've got uh, Catholic scout groups. If you've got a rifle club, oh, we've got a Catholic one. Chess clubs, oh, we've got a Catholic one. Dancers, oh, yeah, we've got Catholic ones. You know, so you could be part of everyone else's sort of thing, but you did it on your own terms with your own. And you know, you can see that happening in modern society with other groups as well. It's a good template. But here you go, best buildings. Greatest building ever built in New Zealand. <laughs> Cathedral of the Blessed Sacrament in Christchurch, sadly destroyed by the earthquakes. But that was a magnificent temple. But it wasn't the only one. Here's the cathedral, uh, um, the convent of the Sacred Heart in Timaru, which was an outstanding building to appear in 1881 in Timaru. You know, it was such an exceptional thing that all the visiting Catholic prelates and big knobs around the world, whenever they came to New Zealand in this period, they always got taken to Timaru. <laughs> Look what we got in Timaru. Sacred Heart nuns, they were the top tier, you know. Sorry for the mercies in the Dominicans. These were the top tier. And they had a convent in Timaru. And it was a pretty magnificent convent, which was still there in my childhood. And, you know, the Basilica in Timaru, now the number one Peter building left, I think. Likewise in South Dunedin, the very first basilica that Frank Peter built. And then in Invercargill, St Mary's Basilica. So those are pretty impressive buildings, and they really put an imprint on the landscape, and they stand up and scream, we're Catholic and we're proud. Alright, Irish identities. Well, it's really important to remember that there were lots of Protestant Irish came here. In fact, it's been estimated that up to 40% of the Irish migration to New Zealand were Protestants from the north. Now, that doesn't actually mean that they were all um, people from the north. They weren't necessarily all Protestants. A lot of Ulster Catholics came here as well, and they're kind of disguised in the figures. But these are some really important guys in Dunedin terms. So on the left, you've got Percy Neal. That's Sam Neal's ancestor. In the middle, you've got um, Mr. Greg, Greg's Coffee. And Robert Wilson over there. These are all guys from Ulster who come to Otago and establish really important businesses here in Dunedin, you know, that endure for a long time. Uh, Wilson Neils puts those two together. Greg's still going strong, not owned by the Greggs anymore, but you know, these are the guys that founded these companies. Uh, these were, you know, hard knuckly businessmen who knew their beans, well educated characters, especially in business. So we get a lot of benefit from that Ulster connection. Uh, Thomas Bracken, Rutherford Waddell. Most outstanding Presbyterian minister of the 19th century in Dunedin. I'm sure you've heard of him. Uh, his, his preaching against uh, the sin of cheapness and you know, sweated labour. And on the right, Harriet Morrison, uh, who was one of the leading suffragists and um, trade unionists. All from Ulster. Well, he's not, but th th they are. Uh, and then you know, you've got St John Brannigan, the first um, commissioner of police for the Mounted Police Force on the Gold Rushes. Uh, John Bevan, Sergeant Major John Bevan, and Andrew Thompson. So he's a, a, a Protestant. These two are traitors to their cause. They're Catholics who trade up to become, you know, Church of England people over here. You know, they <laughs> want to fit in. I'm always a wee bit sorry. I, uh, they're great characters. Uh, it's all on film, isn't it? Okay. I suppose. All right. But these are really important characters. I just want to get the varieties of Irishness. I've been focusing on, you know, the Galway people and all the rest of it. But there's a lot of difference. I'm sure many of you will have connections with um, Irish Protestants and others. Um, and here we go, I think this is quite neat, nice, what I call the Irish criminal nexus. This cartoon captures that. So you've got the crim being rumbled in the night for his uh, illicit whiskey distilling. And then on the other side, you've got the policemen coming to arrest them, they're all Irish. <laughs> the Irish police force in New Zealand, the police force in New Zealand at least was heavily Irish, but it wasn't just Irish Catholic, there was a lot of Irish Protestants as well, and that made for some tensions within the force as well. All right. Sectarianism. I, I don't want to go too much on this, but it's important to note that at different times in New Zealand's history, there has been serious um, tension over sectarian divisions. Here in Otago in the early years, it was principally between um, 
Anglicans and Presbyterians actually in the pioneer settlement. The little enemy, you might be familiar with that term, that, that applied to the Anglicans and Methodists. As, and it was a term imposed by the Presbyterians to denote these buggers amongst them who were you know, countering all the, their, their emphasis on the free church and so on. But subsequently, the Irish Catholic phenomena and the political aspects of Irishness were always a complication through the late 19th century. As in Ireland, uh, the push to have independence um, was a constant um, on one side of the fence and the push to remain part of the um, Union on the other side made that a bit tense, particularly in the North. Now that played out here on a couple of occasions in the 19th century, which I'm not going to go on to, but it re-emerged during World War I. So we had this quite happy period in the late 19th and early 20th centuries where people could you know, uh, rejoice in their own cultural displays. So we have, for instance, New Year's Day in Dunedin was the big event. You go to the Caledonian Games and everyone was part of it. You know, it was a Scottish thing, but you know, the Irish went along, the Chinese went along, the Lebanese went along, everyone was part of it. It was great. But then with war, and that's my grandfather and his cousins there, <coughs> with war came a lot of pressure because as the casualty rates went up, after Gallipoli particularly, pressure went on New Zealand society over who was playing their part. And was there anyone who wasn't pulling their weight? And who was the obvious ones who you think might not be pulling their weight? Irish, Irish Catholics. Well, they actually were pulling their weight because people like my grandfather were happy to go and serve. Um, but there were some who, who weren't prepared to do that and who were very publicly opposed to serving uh, the English king. So you get um, these characters here. Starting in Dunedin. Dunedin was the centre of resistance to conscription and service. This is the Maryland Irish Society that was established in Dunedin in 1916 after the um, rising in, um, in Dublin. And these characters here um, led the charge on that. And I think, but can't prove, we're possibly... Um, connected with the Irish Republican Brotherhood, which is a secret society, so you know it's kind of hard to track those sort of things, but there's a few hints in there that there might have been an oath-bound circle of the IRB operating here on a propaganda basis to push the cause of Sinn Féin. But anyway, what happened was, you had this magazine they established called The Green Ray, this is the Dunedin publication here, World War, um, and it was full bore for Sinn Féin and very treasonous, and so after two years of publishing that to a pretty small group of Irish readers all around the country the police marched in and arrested the editor and the um, manager and they were jailed for two years with hard labour and it was suppressed. At the same time the tablet, the main Catholic magazine in New Zealand, had begun to match it with its fervour for Sinn Féin and this was pretty problematic and they really hit the green ray because they really wanted to hit the tablet but it was a bit dodgy to do so. The uprising on the Catholics might have been too much. So this is um, the guy that was jailed, this is his letter from jail to his wife who lived at Green Island Thomas Cummins with his two little children. So he did time in jail for his um, work on the Green Ray in opposition to service during World War I. This family from Riversdale near Gore are the, are the um, Cody's. They're the most uh, rebellious family in New Zealand. There were two families of Cody's. There were 12 boys between the two families. Not one of them served. A few of them went to jail, but the two years later, most of them went on the run. A couple of them went to South America, some went to Australia, some just headed out around New Zealand. But there they are with their. Um, and further, they had their own branch of the Maryland Irish Society down there in uh, Riversdale. And as it happens, his great grandson used to sit beside me at school, and no idea that he had this uh, illustrious Fenian pedigree. I don't think he did either. He was a big Kiss fan, I remember. That was the main thing I remember about <laughs> Pat Cody, who sat beside me at school. Anyway, at the same time, by 1921, this has become such a fever pitch of sectarian antipathy in New Zealand. And here we have a celebration up at um, uh, St Dominic's. And here's the nuns march on. Here's the, you know, the children of Mary and the cathedral. Look up over here, an Irish Republican flag. Now that didn't go down too well with the Protestants of Dunedin, let me tell you, in 1921. So it really, really became quite fevered. And the election in Dunedin in 1921 was a very sectarian affair. And none of the Catholics made it onto the city council, let me tell you that. But then it dropped away. But meantime, there was a Protestant counterblast, as there always was. This guy here, Howard Elliott, or as the Catholics called him, Coward Yellowlot. <laughs> this is the Orange Lodge meeting for the Agrarian Convention. Here, you recognise that backdrop? That's the Otago Early Settlers Association. So it's right here. So I'm, you know, I'm right in the heart of the Protestant establishment here when I'm working at this place. 
Anyway, so that, that became very quickly the biggest organisation in New Zealand to oppose this Catholic nonsense, you know, the Protestant political association. But then that all collapsed with the establishment of the Irish Free State and Catholic things went into a bit of an abeyance thereafter. And we have a period where we have a much more quiescent Irish Catholic community doing a bit of hurling, Catholic sports, <laughs> doing their own thing, that's the hussies. For a couple of generations we have a quiet reserved, pulled back sort of Catholic community that just keeps its head down and gets on with things on its own basis. It's quite noticeable, the lack of participation in wider societal events. Won't go into that too much, but here's the Christian Brothers um, old boys. And the big thing to note about this is the in-group endogamy. You know what that means? It means people marrying within their own group. Now the Catholics are really big on that. The Bishop Moran sort of style thing was keep the borders. You have the schools, our own schools, and you have people so if you marry someone outside the fold, you know, there's sort of little penalties for that. But you'll be familiar with all that sort of stuff. But it's important to remember, it worked for a while. Um, this is Timaru, the public expression of Catholicism in this sort of high point through the Rosary Sunday procession. I just put that up there because I was the last class as first communicants that took part in this in 1973 or so. And it was a fantastic event. I loved it. But then they didn't do it anymore. It used to be the high point of Catholic life in Timaru at the convent. Anyway, uh, you know, this is that period of the 1950s that many of you will be familiar with, with the Catholic schools struggling away um, and so on and so forth. Now, I'm not going to go into it any further. I just want to point out here the symbolism of this photo with Bishop Boyle, Len Boyle, and Father Martin Flamp. Bishop Boyle was descended from Galway people. There's two names. The Leonards and the Boyles are both Anna Down families. So he's a direct descendant of that pioneer group and, you know, representing the... Um, Church is, is, is quite a quite a nice symbolism of his episcopacy, and Father Martin Flannery behind him. He's the Goldfields Irish connected to my family up in um, uh, Matakanui. But by this point, the church had turned against its Irish heritage in favour of becoming a New Zealand church. This is a post-Vatican II development where they forgot all about the Irish and stopped celebrating all that stuff. And it's all focused on being in New Zealand, you know. So if you go to any Catholic church today, just a good example, go out to St. Pat's in South Dunedin, the Basilica. They did a big renovation a few years ago, and the entrance doors are beautifully marked up with welcome in every language under the sun. We've got 20 languages. I went there to do a talk one night on Irish history, you know. I went, hang on a minute. What language do they leave out? <laughs> How could this be? It's the amnesia. They didn't give it a thought. That should have been the first language. But it wasn't. It wasn't even in there. So, you know, I think that's pretty symbolic. Um, now, the New Irish, and some of you are here, so I just want to touch on the fact that, okay, we've got this. Is this the New Irish? No, this is the New Irishness. This is the bogus bullshit Irishness which you see out the streets today, because yeah. that's what it happens to it, you know? There's nothing Irish about that. That's complete bullshit. Oh, I'm being filmed again. Sorry, I forgot about that. <laughs> Makes me mad as a snake. And it'll be all over North Dunedin. It's just, just, it's just a horror, as far as I'm concerned. But then you've got these people. Professor Sonia Turner, she's just down the back there. Whoa! Wrote this report, you know, accurate, detailed information on Irish people in New Zealand. I recommend you get a hold of that if you haven't read it already. And there's the Irish ambassador, Irish Wolfhound, launching the report here at Toitu last year. So there's a whole new group of Irish in New Zealand now. And they're not like the patties and biddies of yesteryear. They're all really top notch well-educated people, they've still got some PhDs, I don't know about you, Leanne, but half of them have, man, they're clever people. Here's the second ambassador, we've now got a, a, an embassy in New Zealand, we're on to our second ambassador, Jane Connolly there. We've got the Tara Trust being established to, you know, develop and promote Irish culture and heritage in New Zealand. It's a new, new thing, you know. We've got uh, the Irish um, luncheon in Parliament today for St Patrick's Day, that, that's a new phase. And that's by the Irish um, Business Network that you go, they've got them all over the country. That, and they're really focused on trade and connections. It's not sentimental and backward looking, it's forward looking. It's a whole different ball game. I, I find it quite um, amazing and kind of bewildering, but that's, that's Irishness in New Zealand today. And we've got Conor Nagwalga, you know, um, trying to revive Gaelic in New Zealand. And, you know, if you want to, you can join up with weekly classes by Zoom, which I do every week. Bloody hard language, let me tell you that. But um, good fun. Um, so, uh, and later on today, there's going to be one of those classes here um, by Dr. Dermot Coffey, who, who runs um, Conor Nagwalga here. 
And unfortunately, because he's got COVID this week, he's not going to be here in person. It's going to be by Zoom. So you have to do the same hard yards. But it's well worth having a crack at. So that's kind of it from my point of view. That's a quick overview, without going too much into details, of Irish immigration and settlement in New Zealand and what we're really celebrating today when we celebrate the Irish dimension of Otago and Southland history. Thanks very much. Thank you.